Welcome back to our series on the secrets of the scrolls. Uh, so far in previous lessons, we've made mention numerous times about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so today uh, it is time that we just spend some time on them. I realize that we did a session on the new Dead Sea Scrolls, but it only means that they're new to us and the findings of them recently. They've been there all along. So we want to go back and just summarize before we actually start moving ahead now and moving in prophecy, uh, prophecies that are, have been concealed, being revealed, and some revisited. But uh, just looking at the impact of the Dead Sea Scrolls and where they came from and where they are, where are they now and what's happening. So thank you for joining us and uh, we'll get on with this right now. In 1947, a young Bedouin shepherd was chasing after a stray sheep in the Judean desert when he came across a cave. It's the same desert that John the Baptist would have lived in and Jesus was tempted in and David hid here many times. Curious, the young lad, he threw a rock inside to see what would happen. He was surprised when he heard something break. When he entered the cave, he found something that would change the world. There were large clay jars a lot of them, mostly filled with rolled up scrolls. That day he took some back to Bethlehem and sold seven of them to an antiquities dealer. You can see the Dead Sea uh, where the caves are and we'll be using this map quite a bit. And uh, even some of the caves on this are numbered. But this is on here for the reason of if you will look at Qumran, where the blue arrow on the right is pointing, uh, this is the area where the Dead Sea Scrolls, the initial finds, uh, went on. And so the arrow on the left points to Bethlehem. So evidently this Bedouin young lad knew of uh, dealers that would buy these things and he took them to Bethlehem. It did not take long for the word to get out and Hebrew University professor Eliezer Lippa Sukenik decided to see what was up. He found three scrolls still at the dealer. It took seven years for Sukenik's son to find the other four. So what happened? He obtained the three of them, and then his son went on the mission of where did these others go? And the search was on uh, by his son. Uh, he did find them. They are now at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and they belong to the state of Israel. Nine years after archaeologists worked the first cave, ten more caves were found along the Dead Sea with scrolls and artifacts. And these are the numbered caves, and these are not all of them, but if you just look where the caves are and then just come down the one side uh, where Bethlehem and Gedi and Masada, if you just come down through there, there are caves all out through the, that wilderness area, that desert mountainous area. And here I'm standing at Qumran and just taking a picture. And some of these are where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. But just look at the caves, just sort of in your mind, imagine and go treasure hunting. Obviously to the lower right, I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, possibly, and then just start looking around. Let your eyeballs stray for holes in the hills. 
and those could open up very much to have treasure inside of them. So here's the city of Qumran, and once again, looking at where some of the other caves are, some more numbers are cropping up. Documents found in caves outside of Qumran came from Nahil Hever, Wadi Murabaat, and Masada. These are where some of the new Dead Sea Scrolls have come from. And the arrows, the, starting from the top, counting down one and two, are pointing to those two caves. And a lot of those were Bar Kokhba's caves, where the last revolt in the first century uh, ended, but he knew to hide them there. As word spread, cave raiders took the tre took the treasures to make a fortune. Here's an ad that appeared in the Wall Street Journal on June 1st, 1954. The four Dead Sea Scrolls, biblical manuscripts dating back to at least 200 BC are for sale. This would be an ideal gift to an educational or religious institution by an individual or group. Box F206, of course there's no name on it. This lasted one day. The Wall Street Journal, due to Israel uh, applying pressure and saying these are these are not to be for sale. They belong to us. The Wall Street Journal dropped it. And the, the four Dead Sea Scrolls, that box just was immediately closed. As 1956 drew to a close, a deal was made between the Bedouin hunters and the Israeli government. The Bedouins turned all their findings over to the Jordanian Antiquities Authority, who gave them to Hebrew University in the state of Israel. Then May 14, 1948, Israel becomes a nation. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found the year before. And so Israel becomes a nation in 48. And we would say happy birthday to Israel because Israel looks at the Dead Sea Scrolls as God's birthday gift to them as they became a nation. Today, the Dead Sea Scrolls can be found at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. The Shrine of the Book is what the building that they are housed in is called. And actually, the picture I'm showing you is ground level there, but the Dead Sea Scrolls are below ground. And there are further, I have no idea how much further they've dug down into the limestone and made very secure buildings and, and safety that house these scrolls. Now, the thing of note, if you look to the right at the water fountain, that is like the top of one of the jars that the scrolls were found in. They made a huge top right there and they painted it white. And then over on the left is a large just wall and is just totally black on all sides. And this represented the children of light and the children of darkness. The Essenes, who were the caretakers of the scrolls and hid the vast majority of them, they always felt that they were the sons of, the, of light or the children of light, and that there was the, they were waiting for Messiah to come and that they could defeat the children or the people of darkness. And so in honor of the Essenes, as well as even Jesus talked about children of light, and people being in darkness, children of darkness. And so he, he, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, made an allusion to the Essenes and what they were doing and what they were, and what they were called. But Jesus Christ went further by saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That, hey, the Messiah that everyone's been looking forward to is here, and he was Messiah. This is the spiral up through the ceiling to the top there, where the handle of the scroll is and points. That would be where that white top is. And so you can see we're actually a couple floors underground. There's a picture without people, and it is around this that the famous Isaiah scroll is, is rolled out 
in a circular a walk around that you can walk around and look at it. And as we've already studied, you see where the pages were glued? Look at them carefully. Very interesting. Now let's scroll down for some more knowledge. And do you see the tops of the jars? And we think back to the white uh, fountain and the top, the large one symbolically, how close they are. So uh, there's a play on words and a pun, so pardon my puns, I love to use them occasionally. Here's some more knowledge about the Dead Sea Scrolls. The general time span covered by the scrolls is approximately 580 before Christ to 318 after Christ. So a large span of time right here. The 580 is right in the time of Jeremiah and when Nebuchadnezzar has come and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And so it only makes sense that you know the army's coming. What to do is take anything of valuable that we can, get it out of town. And so the Essenes possibly are just people uh, grabbed scrolls and left with them. The Essenes were the caretakers in the end and put them in the caves because of the Roman destruction coming on. Much, now, you know, like 600 years later. Uh, and this, they destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so what happened to Sakari, who were the revolters, the last of them fled down to Qumran, where they talked to the Essenes and said, we're, we're headed down to Masada to take our last stand, a big fortress. And you can come with us if you want, or stay, but just know the Romans are coming and they're destroying everything. So what happened is the Essenes put many of, probably many of the scrolls into those caves and then they took some with them and they they followed down after the Sakari and they were in Masada. Also some of them, not all of them, some hid in caves. There were between eight and nine hundred texts found and over fifty thousand fragments. A lot of these were puzzles that you the fragments you would take and put them back together. The treasure what is the treasure, the, these finds about the Bible? What it, what's, what's all, all about and in the Bible that matters here? All right, here's some biblical things. Number one, Esther is the only book not found, not one fragment of all 66 books of our Bible, just nothing on Esther. There are 37 copies of Psalms because the Essenes were copying them and other scribes had made many copies. 33 copies of Deuteronomy and 24 of Genesis. Most of the Old Testament scrolls had very little variance to our Bible. They, our Bible translation is basically spot on. Some fragments were found with Bible verses on them. They were stored in phylacteries, which the Jewish men would bind around their foreheads. These verses were to be memorized and used in worship. And even today, the, the Jewish men will bind these around their forehead when they go to the wall, the Western Wall, to pray. And they have pieces of scripture rolled up in them that they have memorized, that have mean something to them, that, that something they're trying to live in their life and to apply it in their life. And these are what they look like. And you can see it's around his arm also. And here are some of the verses that were found with the phylacteries in the caves. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you. I think the phrase that the, the promise that they would take is that God's with you, and he will visit us again. And it shall be for a token upon your hand, and for frontlets between your eyes, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us up out of Egypt. And so this was to keep this in mind of what God had done for them. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. This was another Bible verse that was found in one of the phylacteries.
Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that ye may be as frontlets between your eyes. And the Isaiah scroll, which is the oldest of all the scrolls by a thousand years, it rolls out to 24 feet long and contains all 66 chapters of that book. The scrolls were written in three languages, 75% in Hebrew. There's some in Aramaic and a few in Greek. But keep in mind, we were, the scrolls were written in the Hebrew speaking time. The temple scroll was the longest at 26.7 feet, and it gives all the information on how to build the first temple. So that they, they had the blueprints and what went in it and how they did it. The Qumran Cave 11 contained 15,000 fragments and 500 scrolls. And there it is on our map. You can see how, how easy the access was to the people that lived there. And so they could load that up. It was the, one of the closest ones. There's Qumran. And you can see where they walked to to get to Cave 11. Cave 4 had a scroll that mentions, quote, the Son of God in a prophecy. Since Jesus is never mentioned by name in any of this scroll, no one is sure that it is really about him. There's that cave. Once again, from perspective, from the city. And then I found a list, and it's important to notate that not only were Bible scrolls found, but great writings from these eras and these times were found, and who the authors were. And so it appears that in the past there was some kind of a, a library in Jerusalem or at Qumran, even though that would not have been its name, but maybe that it was built earlier to, to house a library of the writings of the world, much like the, the, Alex, the libraries at Alexandria. But it was not that big. And so they found these... Uh, writings and copies to the far right. And I would just say stop the video and just look at it for a few minutes and it'll give you opportunity to study and to think about. You've heard of many of these people. Pliny the Younger was, uh, was a historian, wrote about the Essenes. We, uh, we saw that uh, last week. But look down low at Homer and Aristotle Aristophanes, and then there were some New Testament ones. These would have been the last ones written. And copies that survived, over 5,000, which is incredible. And so have fun looking at that. What do the Dead Sea Scrolls mean to us today as we sort of wrap things up? Number one, they support the accuracy of the Word of God. Now, they are not the final say of the Bible and the Word of God. Even if none of these scrolls were found and we had the Bible, it's still the Word of God. It doesn't change anything. And so the Word of God is absolute truth and the foundation. But these support the accuracy of it. And it just goes to prove it just strengthens the fact that the Word of God is absolute truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The second thing, the two main topics that come out of these scrolls is number one, the righteousness of God. God is holy and therefore because of that, this is how we must live. And so the righteousness of God translate overs to the right living of mankind. While God is righteous and God is holy. And that is, the, that is one of the main topics of these scrolls and the verses and the books that are found and what is in those books. And then, then some of these side writings. Then secondly, 
the prophecies of the coming of the Messiah. The many, many prophecy books were found, and they, it was all about our Messiah is coming, believe. Even though judgment of God is upon us or is coming upon us, our Messiah is going to come and call us together and deliver us and reign over us. And that's still a truth that, that we are awaiting for. We, but Jesus came the first time, but was rejected. As Christians, we're waiting for Christ to come back. The Jews are still waiting for Messiah to show up. They support the preservation of the Bible. And I say amen to that. We continue to find things that support the preservation of the Bible. There's still things being turned up today in Jerusalem that do this. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. For they offer one of the greatest windows to the past that's ever been found. Just start reading. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, 89. The word of God changed the lives of those who touched and read those scrolls. Scripture is still today doing the same. And like them of old, we are changed forever. And now there is one more thing. One cave had two copper scrolls, which detailed 63 locations where treasure is buried. Temple treasure, treasures out of God's house. And since no one has found any, it probably is not true. Or... Join us next time as we continue this with the Copper Scrolls.